All right, so welcome to the Rebel Yell, uh, where we're going to talk about everything softball, from hitting, pitching, uh, to mental toughness. In this episode, we're going to talk about pitch calling, and with me is Alden Wadley. Hey, Alden. Hi. So why don't you tell us about yourself? Hi, so yeah, um, I have been around softball now for, oh gosh, about 18 years. Um, I started out playing t-ball, coach pitch, all the good fun stuff before there was coach pitch travel leagues. Um, so I started playing competitive fast pitch when I was about eight years old. I've been pitching since I was eight years old. Um, nice. Played basketball and volleyball as well from the time that I was eight all the way up through my freshman year of high school. Decided to specialize in softball uh, my sophomore year on up. I played competitive travel teams anywhere from the KC Metro to the Wichita area. I lived in Abilene, Kansas at the time. Now I'm currently in Kansas City full-time. I played, I ended up going to play softball at Johnson County. And then I had a recurring knee injury that started my sophomore year of high school. That unfortunately ended my career after my sophomore season at Johnson County. Uh, while I was at Johnson County, my freshman year, we ended up winning league or winning conference and then uh unfortunately lost in the tournament to go to nationals came back my sophomore year and we I think we placed third in a conference and then ended up winning regionals and going on to place third in the nation in the njcaa d2 tournament nice um then after again blew out my knee i ended up actually going and managing at a University of Kansas for their softball team. So I was around all of the operations, all of the pitching, all the practices, and got to see how a D1 program worked. And that was awesome. You know, like I said, I was around a lot of the pitching. I got to be around a lot of the coaching and absorb everything. You know, you never really get away from absorbing all of the information that you get, even if you're not playing anymore. Right. So I went on to, um, I managed for a year and then decided just to focus on school and kind of get to, I guess, back to kind of normal life after softball, if there really is a thing. Um, ended up having a fourth knee surgery, actually in August of 2018, so yeah, almost two years ago now, to kind of get everything fixed up. And luckily, I ended up finding a surgeon out in Colorado who did who worked miracles I like to say so once I got back into full mobility on my knee I decided to seek out some coaching opportunities and that's how I came to the Rebels currently I am assisting with 10U and 12U I'm also giving pitching lessons through the organization I have 20 girls right now I think give or take a few um and so yeah that's a little bit about me I cool. guess kind of unrelated softball stuff. I have a bachelor's of applied science and biotechnology. So I am a, I'm a nerd at heart as well, as well as an athlete. So fun fact. So when yeah. the coaches get together, you're the smartest one. Sure. For sure. Yep. Absolutely. All right. All right. So we're going to talk about pitch calling. Yes, we are. So this is going to be great. Uh, why don't you just dive in? I've got a bunch of questions that I've got in my head. Um, but you know, uh, you know, the intent I think is to, to help the coaches understand, uh, pitch calling, um, understanding their pitchers. And then I, I'm going to go a step further and try to share this with a lot of our team's, uh, hitters. So I can't think of a better way to, uh, be a better hitter than to understand pitch and pitch callings. So take it away. Perfect. So first, um, I'm just going to kind of talk about your pitcher before I get into pitch calling, just talking about knowing your pitchers and what you should look for in a pregame warm up. So when you decide who's going to pitch a game, um, typically how I, and by any means, this is just all recommendations. This isn't a live by die by rules. I always like to have a starter and um, a relief pitcher. Generally, if you're going to start fast, I wouldn't relieve with somebody fast. So if you can find your pitching staff where you have somebody that throws gas and then you have somebody that throws movement, you have somebody that may be able to just locate really well, different stuff like that, that those are kind of how I would pair them together. How do you, uh, make, up your, how do you make up your mind between which one you start, the, the speed pitcher or the movement pitcher? Like, is there, a, is there a system to 
which one you start? So I really truly think it depends on kind of who you're playing. Okay. Um, most teams have a reputation. If you aren't sure about who you're playing, then it really is up to you. I don't think that there's, you're going to know pretty quickly. Like if you throw somebody in there that throws gas and they're hitting her, great, mix it up. You know, it's not, I wouldn't leave anybody in there for a long time if mm -hmm. you see that they're struggling. Because sometimes, again, pitchers that just throw movement struggle. And sometimes pitchers that have a fastball and a changeup and maybe one other pitch but they throw gas can also struggle. You've got to be able to mix it up. So yeah. I wouldn't say that there's a meth, uh, method behind it. I think it really just depends on kind of the team you're playing, if you are able to do any scouting. Something that I recommend doing that I – have done for a long time is I keep a I keep a notebook of every pitcher that I play, every team that we play, every pitch that I call, if they hit the ball, if they were hit, what happened, and then I kind of keep that in a file. So in case we were to play those teams again, I can always pull those forward. That's something I can recommend. It helps with again helps with your scouting. Sure. Part of it. So that's kind of how I make my decisions based on that. No, if we're gonna if we're gonna play a tough game, I typically throw my my fastest pitcher in, and then I always have a kind of a junk pitcher, I guess you would call them, in relief. Yeah. But I'm also notorious for believing that if you can hit spots, you can do well in a game, and you don't yeah. have to throw 60 miles per hour in order to do that. So sometimes if you're playing a team that might be uh, what you would consider to be top notch, they've got a great winning record. Um, they've played a lot of huge tournaments and they've, and they've really beaten up some really big teams. You might start with somebody that is more of a spot pitcher. That's a little bit slower, assuming that girls like that would be used to really fast pitching. And then maybe on the flip side, if you had a team that maybe just first moved into your division um, and they struggled in the age or division that they were in um, that, you know, maybe you, you start with gas because they're not used to, you know, the, the higher level or age level uh, of speed, maybe. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And also something that's kind of different with when you start throwing more movement pitches, like for me, I very rarely threw a fastball in college. I threw a screwball and a curveball 99% of the time for an inside and outside pitch. And my screwball was faster than my fastball. Hmm. Okay. And you, and you see that happen sometimes, just the nature of the spin. If you have somebody that can throw super, super tight spin, that can sometimes come off harder. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, when you're throwing somebody in there that throws junk, if you have somebody that can throw junk, but also throw hard junk, you know, it's pretty hard to touch. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Good stuff. Okay. So, now, when you get into your warmups, I would recommend speaking to your catchers kind of about if you're not able to watch warmups, speaking to your catchers about, hey, were they struggling with the pitch? Did their locations look off? Because I'm sorry, but no pitcher's ever going to throw every pitch perfect every single time they step on that mound. Something's always going to be off. It's going to happen. Whether it's their changeups off, whether their curveball's not moving as much as it usually does, it happens. You have to learn to live with that and it's gonna be okay. Okay. Um, you know, as long as, that's why for me, like, yes, I said I threw, I threw my screwball and curveball more times than not. I still was able to locate a fastball in the off chance that, hey, my curveball's not moving. I still need to be able to hit an outside corner. Okay. So you should always have those options in the back of your mind to make sure that you are covered in your locations. Because okay. once you get, I would say anywhere past about 12B, you really shouldn't be throwing anything down the middle. Yeah. 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 The hitting, the hitting starts to catch up at that point. Yeah. Because you, you notice that sometimes um, through the age progression, uh, pitching will, will speed up and, you know, all the girl has to do is throw it down the middle and, and, you know, tons of strikes and, and you win games and then hitting leapfrogs above that. And they literally hit everything and then pitching, so it's sort of this catch-up game back and Absolutely. forth. Yeah, I think you're right. That's probably about the right age. And then you're looking at all this new bat technology, which has even evolved more and more than when I was in college. I mean, you're looking at these 
I think, what is the new ghost, a double barrel technology something or other that can smack. Sure. I, I swung that bad. I barely swung in that thing. It looked like it was going over the fence. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's crazy. You don't. And, and that is also sometimes the hard thing with a hard, with a pitcher that throws harder is all you have to do is barely put a bat on the ball and it can go. Yeah, the, space hit. the speed behind it is what's helping that ball. Yeah. So it really, you know, I guess my long answer to that would be do your recruiting, do your research, know who you're, know who you're playing. So would you, would you recommend having somebody on staff that does that, um, um, is dedicated for something like that? It seems, it seems like there's a lot that goes on as far as, uh, lineup, um, who's playing what, um, you know, game changer. Um, there's, there seems to be a lot to manage if adding that piece into it would be awesome, but it would be a lot. Do you, if, do you I think wouldn't say that you would necessarily need somebody on staff for that game changer is a great tool. And I would say about 95% of teams out there nowadays have game changer, go see how they did against the team, whether it's just your recruiting in that tournament, like pool games per se. All right, you're playing against a team. See how they did against the other teams in your pool. So then you can kind of have an idea like, all right, we did well against this team in the pool. This is who we threw. This is how we'd hit, et cetera, et cetera. Wow, they really struggled against that team. So, you know, we may be okay. It's just kind of some different things you can look at in that dynamic. So I would really use Game Changer. Um, and then I would really suggest keeping track of what you're calling, keeping track of your pitch calls, keeping track of what each batter does. Because then you already have that aspect of recruiting without even really doing it because you're doing it in the middle of the game. Yeah. No, I love it. I love it. Okay. So that would be my recommendations because I get it is super hard to do. Yeah. But if you can at least do those two little pieces, kind of get an idea of what you're doing before, look at Game Changer, use those resources out there, then just get an idea, then just keep track of what you're throwing them. Yeah. See what happens. And when you get into a game, you know, you're going to know if you call pitch and the ball goes somewhere, they probably miss their location. You're going to know that just by, and I'll, I'll get into that, but you can, you can typically tell if a pitcher's not hitting their location and what's going to happen as well. Okay. But again, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay. Um, I, I think going into once we finish up the warm up part of it, making sure you know you're talking to your pitchers, talk to them, see how they felt during warm up. Were they struggling with anything? You know, get an idea of where their head's at because pitching is 100% mental. If you don't think they're in the right headset during warm-up, don't start them. Okay. Don't, don't do it. I mean, if they're sitting there negative, like, oh, my changeup looks like crap. I struggled here. This looks like crap. Nothing positive is coming out of their mouth. Don't start them. They're not mentally ready. So then what's going to happen is they get in there, say they miss a pitch, and that goes a long way. Well, then your mental game is completely tanked. Yep. Give them some time to kind of settle in, and maybe that requires a little bit more warm-up. Maybe they need to just get into the game a little bit, whether they are just hitting or whether they're playing another position. Let them get into the game a little bit and get that mental game kind of back on track. Okay. So, you know, a response I would typically like to look for is saying, you know, my change-up – something that I can work with as a pitching coach. So, you know, my changeup felt like it was slow, but my fastball looked good. I was hitting my locations. My drop ball looked good, et cetera, but my changeup just looked slow. Kind of making it, spinning a positive way on it. You know, what can I do different? And whether, you know, sometimes coaches just don't know that, but enough of your, enough of the pitchers should be seeing their pitching coaches that they should have an idea of what to do if their changeup slow. So maybe initiate that conversation. Okay. If your change up slow in the past, what has your pitching coach suggested you do? And just help talk them through it because, you know, not every team's going to be fortunate enough to have somebody as a pitching coach on staff, especially in travel ball. Okay. So initiate those conversations, help them work through that. I know at least the way that I coach is I, I coach girls to give them the ability to know what they're doing wrong and know how to fix it. So that way they don't feel lost on the mound. Yeah. So we talk about, you know, if the ball's going high, all right, what's happening? What are the two possibilities that could be happening? All right, let's make an adjustment. Change one of them, see if that helps. Then that way you're not getting lost on the mound and you're not in a huge fret of 
crap. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to change. My ball's going high. I, I can't figure out, you know, then, then you just start that mental game again. It goes. Yeah. The key thing as a pitcher is you have to keep that mental game strong no matter what. Yeah, yeah I've noticed that with hitting too. Yeah, absolutely. It's, a lot of it is, is mental. And um, once you start getting in your head, it's hard to get out. Um, and a lot of times there's, uh, you know, quite a bit of effort on uh, not worrying and not thinking, overthinking mechanics, but trusting what you do um, and relax. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. So let's um, kind of get into the game. Okay. Start in that game. So, all right, your pitcher's on the mound, your first batter's coming up. For the most part, I think in your top of your lineups, you're going to see probably a slapper. You're going to see somebody quick. You may see somebody, maybe not a slapper, but somebody that can either lay down a bunt or just super quick that can get on base. You know, for those, let's just talk about a slapper perspective. If somebody can throw a screwball, I definitely recommend a screwball as a first pitch because right. as your slapper is coming towards you, because that's how it is, they're, they're almost coming at an angle. So they're coming at you to hit the ball, but they're also trying to get towards first as soon as they make contact. So considering a screwball, it's coming in, but it's completely breaking. So yeah. a lot of the times that should be a swing and miss if it's breaking in the right places. Yeah, because I know that for um, teaching slapping, you know, a, a huge emphasis is to not peel off too quick. Absolutely. And a lot of times yeah. girls do that. Yeah. Yeah. So you can capitalize on that. If they don't step directly, they don't take that initial first step towards uh, the, um, the pitcher and instead they cheat and come out just a little bit. They've left that outside edge wide open. Absolutely. Okay. So, um, you know, I, for the most part, I don't, unless a slapper is really casting, I typically don't throw them inside. Okay. But, uh, cause a lot of times if they're slapping, they can keep their hands inside the ball pretty well. Yeah. But if you go ahead, I was going to say, do you, when you, so that's the first pitch you throw is a, a screw ball. Do you, you pretty much just for a slapper live on the outside edge of the plate? I try to for the most part. Um, like I said, if unless they're casting pretty bad, then I may go inside on them. But um, like I said, for the most part, most slappers that I see can keep their hands inside the ball pretty well. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to live on that outside corner. What about um, high pitches on a slapper? Because I know that um, there are several slaps that have a downward motion to it, mm -hmm. as far as you know, um, some sort of a drag or a chop. Um, but it has sort of that downward motion to it. And if it, if it has a, a high, like a, a rise ball or a high fastball, um, will they struggle with something like that as opposed to like a power slap where, you know, that's kind of a setup that if it's a nice high pitch and they see it coming, you know, they can drive with their high, you know, drive high hands through it and, and poke it kind of over the infield. But, but I feel like a majority of the other slaps sort of have a downward motion to it. Does a high pitch work or do you stay away from that with them? So um, that's a great question. Power slap, I try to stay away from it. And with just a regular slap, I think you're absolutely correct. They do in a downward motion. So I think you are fine throwing a high pitch. Um, the only reason I would stay away from a rise ball is sometimes just depending on where your slapper is at. So this is the hard part about pitches. If you have somebody that can throw a rise ball really well, then you're probably okay. But if you have girls that are just learning a rise ball, a lot of times they're coming in high and going higher. So if you have a slapper that's really running towards you as they're about to hit the ball, they're probably going to catch that pitch before it's rising. Yeah, I get you. And then that just creates really, I mean, depending on if you're hitting a corner or not, really just creates – meatball yeah well, I get you <laughs> so get that. a good point it's it's learning your pitchers um and and learning on do they make that rise ball you know really come in and drive up really quickly do they have that spin or is it kind of just a lackluster all right it's coming in and then we're we're, we're diving right at the end okay. because it works that works on a batter who's just a regular batter 
because most of the times if they're going to be in the middle back of the box, they're going to catch it when it's rising versus if they're in the front of the box, they're going to catch it before it moves. Yeah. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that makes sense. So I'm, I'm reading through your outline here that you kind of sent me making sure so that, was, that was, that was the, that was the, yeah, that was the first hitter. Yeah. Do you want to, are there any other spots in the order that you do specific things to? So, um, really, so like say your first batter gets on base nine times out of 10, your next batter is either going to bunt. They're going to try and get that runner to move. Ideally, actually, if you know that they're in a bunt, I typically like to throw a screwball or even a rice ball to get them to pop up. Okay. Um, now, again, we go back to that rise ball. You have to make sure that you can at least get it in the zone enough to where it's going to get enough spin that it will pop up. Yeah. So a lot of times I throw a lot of movement on those because you either want them to go foul or you want them to pop up and yeah. then try to get a double play out of it. Now, say that runner didn't get on base. You just have a normal hitter that comes up to bat. I think you look, for me, I look at where they're standing in the box. So if they're in the front of the box, means they're probably thinking your pitcher's not throwing very hard, and that's okay. If they're in the back of the box, they're probably thinking that they're throwing pretty hard. So then you have to look at where they're standing. Are they crowding the plate? Are they not crowding the plate? If they're crowding the plate, I'm going to throw inside all day long. Because nine times out of ten, they're crowding the plate because they can't get their hands around to the ball and they want an outside pitch. Gotcha. So your screw balls, your fastball inside, you know, depending on how confident your pitcher is in her changeup to throw them off, off balance, change up first pitch. I'm all for that as well. Um, especially if they've been seeing, they've been taking some cuts off your fastball or off your other pitches, then you come off and throw them off balance with the changeup. I'm all for that. Um, I talk to a lot of my pitchers about placement with changeups and where to go if they're throwing it for an O2 or where they're going to throw it for, you know, no, nothing, nothing. Yeah. So, you know, obviously for an O2 pitch, you don't want to throw that at their waist. You want that yeah. thing to drop out of there. Right. So I talk about that a lot as far as placement with and how that how they can place it. Yeah. So it's it's not just knowledge on your part, but it's also knowledge on your pitcher's part as well. And I strongly suggest that pitching coaches start talking about stuff like that. Yeah. So with the girls, you know, one, two, three, um, you know, I guess going in order of speed to probably with a little bit more power mm -hmm. at three. Um, but one, two, three, or, you know, you're talking about um, if you don't have a slapper, if you don't have somebody that's, you know, bunting in one or two, you've got a similar style of batter where you've got somebody who's got um, good contact percentage, um, usually can lay down a bunt if they want to. Yeah. They're consistent batters, good athletes. Um, and then as you get to three, they're going to hit with a little bit more power, um, a little bit more contact to, to drive runners, you know, around the bases. Do you stay with a consistent pitch calling, you know, that if you don't have a slapper um, with girls like that versus, versus like a four or five hitter who's going to potentially be taller, heavier, um, swings way faster, you know, has a really crazy high exit velocity. Like, do you attack them differently than you would the, the, the top, you know, the one, two, three hitters versus the five, six hitters? Yeah. Um, you know, for me, when you're coming up against your essential power hitters, I typically jam them because most of the time they are going to be bigger. They're going to crowd that plate because they want to, they, they have a hard time keeping their hands inside the ball, but when they can do it, it's gone. You yeah. know, I don't, I typically don't throw anything high. I keep it about knees and below. Um, because the hard times are when you're throwing a high fastball or you're throwing a rise ball, a lot of the times those can hang. And you may not get that fastball right there. Well, then you're throwing it in home run territory. Yeah. So for the most part on those, what we like to call power hitters, regardless of whether you're throwing them in or out, I wouldn't give them anything that's really above their knees. Okay. So you keep, keep it low. low. Yeah. I keep it low. Absolutely. And then we go into a drop ball. I'm perfectly comfortable throwing that. But the problem is it has the same issue as a rise ball. If you hang a drop ball, it's neat as well. 
So you have to be confident that that drop ball is going to drop out of the plate every time. So do you combine that maybe like if you're going to throw a drop on a four or five hitter that you throw the drop inside yeah. is that a really difficult spot for a girl, a, a taller or uh, uh, a, a little bit larger, taller girl would have a hard Absolutely. time maybe reaching that. You know, either that or I combine um, kind of your uh, in and out pitches. So your screwball curveballs, okay. keeping those low. Um, your change up, keeping that low as well. If you're going through for, say you get up 0-2, you're going for a strikeout pitch, I would go about two balls off the plate because most people like to go strikeout pitch. They like to go high or they like to go low. I would even go two balls off the plate. You know, take your, if they're a right-handed batter, take your curveball and instead of having it hit, you know, we've all seen those plates that have the red, yellow, green. Instead of having it hit kind of yellow and then going green, have it hit green and go further. Yeah then you're seeing it come in, but you're still chasing it because it's getting that nice dip. You know, for the most part, I like to see them chase. Well, and with two strikes, you know, they're gonna, I mean, they're, gonna, they're gonna be more likely to chase because they know they're, you know, the strike zone just got bigger all of a sudden. Yeah. And for the, and most times your four batters are going to be a little bit taller per se. So their strike zones are going to be a little bit bigger. So mm -hmm. again, making sure you're keeping that at the knees and not letting that go above, I think is your key to win there. You know, my pitching coach in college always like to say, keep it low, keep it low, keep it low. It's yeah. exactly what you have to do. Yeah. I, I'm short, so I don't, I don't know what it feels like, but I would assume as a tall person, you know, that if you measure the distance from your eyes to your knees from a short person to a tall person, it's obviously much uh, taller. I mean, the, the distance is much greater that you may get something at your knees and, and think, oh, that's a ball all day long because it's so far away. But in reality, it's right at your knees. Absolutely. And, you know, you, you do, you get that bigger strike zone because you are taller. Just, you know, your strike zone may be, I don't even know, it may be, say, four feet tall versus a little person where it may be two or three feet. You know, I'm thinking 12-year-olds because that's what I coach, obviously. But, yeah. you know, you're, you're looking at that perspective. Like, I have a little girl who's – really super tiny and she's hard to throw to because her strike zone's about this big <laughs> yeah versus when you get girls that are taller you know your strike zone gets wider yeah it gets taller so yeah it is i think it's a deaf deaf perspective looking at it from a taller batter because yeah you say oh that's coming low well no it's actually coming straight to your knees yeah one of the things that i've tried to comment with some of our uh taller girls depending on how they're built um, in order to have their pants fit right, sometimes the bottom of their pants um, goes further than their knee. It goes, you know, it's supposed to stop right below the knee, but it'll go further because it's a bigger pant size, maybe to fit their waist or, or whatever. Um, I'll ask the girls, some of the taller girls, like I said, to move their pant leg up, the bottom of their pant leg up, so it's it's closer up to their knees. I know that there's been some I read an article, I can't remember his name, but he was a, a major league baseball player. He was six plus, like six three, but he commented that he used to get strikes called that were below his knees. So he would mess around with his socks and like pull them up, you know, as sort of a joke to the umpires, but to say, look, man, my strike zone is here. Stop calling, you know, the strike zone where you think it is. Recognize that because I'm a tall person, the strike zone starts higher than what you think it is, but give them the visual cue by pulling your pant leg up to right below your knee to where it looks like all the other girls, you know, as far as where they're hitting, if your pants, you know, are a little bit too long. No, I don't disagree with that at all. And, you know, unfortunately, umpires aren't going to change their strike zones all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, they just may have a huge strike zone the whole time. And yeah. if they may call something at your head for a really tiny girl, that would be essentially at about the chest of a taller girl. And they yeah. just won't change it. That, that's just their strike zone. You know, and as a, as a pitcher and as a coach and as a hitter, you have to recognize that. It's called opening up the zone. You know, be able to get your hands inside the ball but also swing high versus coming at swinging low or foul yeah. it off. Try and get something that you know can be your pitch. It's just – it's pitch selection, but it's also being smart and knowing what your umpire is calling. Yeah. Yeah. Um, speaking of umpires – um how do you how do you adjust for the umpire 
you know, because they they seem to be as uh, influential. I would assume that they are as influential in pitch calling as pitchers. You know, whether you're facing a, a one batter or four batter, that if you've got somebody calling a really really tight strike zone versus a real really big strike zone, do you make adjustments for that? And if so, how? So that starts in practice. Um, you go to practice and. I actually learned this at the NFCA conference that I attended back in January, but you go practice and you say, all right, they're not calling inside today. So all you've got is the outside corner. They're not calling inside. Practice that because practice, if you practice like you're going to play in a game, then that just makes the game that much easier. You're prepared yeah. for those situations. You're, I, sorry, I cannot talk today. But you're prepared for those situations. Sure. So you're not – because then, again, we go back to the mental. If you're not prepared for that situation, you are going to crumble. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll do some adjustments with hitting where we'll do a uh, soft toss and we'll do a whole bucket of um, two strikes. So, you know, we'll soft toss to the girl saying you got two strikes against you. So, you know, the strike zone got bigger, you know, one ball wider on each side and one ball taller and, and shorter. So um, it's a different approach like you said, and you have to practice for it. So you yeah. have to be mentally prepared to say, look, you know, he's calling him, he's calling him at my knees. Um, and it's like, well, you better be comfortable hitting a low pitch because if, if he's comfortable giving you your knees, I can guarantee that the pitcher picked up on it. And I can yeah. guarantee somebody like you who's calling the pitches and picked up on it. And man, I, I you know, you can pitch there. You're going to live down there. Absolutely. Especially if you're getting the strikes and they're not swinging. So you better be comfortable hitting inside, outside, high and low. And it all comes back to practice. You know, something I do in my lessons is we do a lot of mental toughness stuff. So if we're going to do innings, we're not going to do innings starting with an OO count every time. Yeah. You're going to come in and all right, you have a 2 count. You got to come back and get this batter. If you walk them, you have push-ups. You know, it's building that into your head or all right, umpire's not calling outside today so that takes care of our screwball or our, I mean sorry our curveball can't throw our curveball can't throw our fastball outside can't throw anything so you've got to live with your screwball or I, some people can throw a backdoor curve you know that's coming out on the inside corner you have to practice being without a pitch because that's going to happen yeah no you're right you're right so what? it all it comes down to you know, your game, your games are not places that you make changes. No, no. And unfortunately, they just can't be. So you have to prepare for those situations. Yeah. Um, so let's, let, I want to ask you about, because we, you talked about it briefly, um, where we were talking about the four hitter, you know, being a taller girl. Um, how much does size of a batter influence what you throw? Um, so if you have a really, I know we talked about um, position in the batter's box, you know, that if, yeah. she, if she's in the back or she's in the front. And I think one of the adjustments that we've thought about is, um, you know, that if, if a girl is in the, the front of the, of the batter's box, you know, does the uh, fastball look different to her versus if she's in the back of the box because she's um, expecting all the speed, does the change up really, really screw her up? Um, and then you mentioned, you know, being on the inside, uh, you know, throwing inside if she's kind of crowding the plate. But what about the size of the kids? So if you've got a four foot 11 kid or a, you know, six foot kid or maybe a heavy set kid or a really skinny kid or somebody who's got really long arms, like does, does, does that affect what you throw and how you throw at them? Do you pick on them uh, in certain ways based on their size? So there's a lot that yeah, goes in. I don't in. mean it to sound mean. There, no, there's just a lot that you kind of compounded into one question. So for me, looking at a batter, I don't necessarily actually focus on height. Obviously, the only thing that height brings you is it's bringing you either a bigger or a smaller strike zone. Okay. Relatively, you're still throwing the same pitches. So it's like if you know we're throwing a low inside, a low inside pitch, you know that that's got to hit about at their knees. And we've talked about, you know, you want to release at your hip. That's where you want to release to get that ball low. And then I've talked about throwing a high and say a high inside pitch or a high outside pitch. Ideally, we want to aim 
for about their chest or about right under their armpit. And that's going to vary for each kid that steps up to the plate. So really, I guess that's the only place that I talk about height is because it's going to change where essentially you throw that high pitch. Your target, your target moves. Correct. Okay. And for a pitcher, all that does is adjust your release point. Okay. So, um, which isn't hard to do as long as they've worked on it. You know, it's, it's the difference between releasing at your hip versus releasing slightly past your hip. Sure. Sure. That, that's really the difference there. So height isn't necessarily as big of a thing as much as they, as actually where they're standing in the box. Okay. So if they're in the front of the box, your drop ball and your rise ball probably aren't going to be effective because they're easily going to probably catch those pitches before they're moving. Your screwball and curveball, they start moving a little bit before they hit the plate, ideally. So they're still going to have enough spin on them that they might still mess them up just a little bit. Okay. So when you get somebody that's at the front of the box, generally that's how a lot of people defending it's really good rise ball pitchers is by moving to the front of the box okay. because you can catch that pitch before it moves. Okay. So that's kind of a hitting tip there. Like I know in college before we played a team that had a really good rice ball pitcher, all I did was throw rice balls to my batters get them in college, prepared. get them prepared, get them prepared for it, get them to see that something yeah. else you can do in a hitting situation. If you do have a rice ball pitcher is actually not have the girls hit, but have them put a glove on and catch where that ball it lands and catch it where they would hit that. So so your glove hand, obviously mine's going to be my left hand. So you're coming around. I'm a right-handed batter. You're coming around and you act like you're going to catch the ball where you would essentially hit it. Okay. See if you can catch it before it moves. If you – see if you – she's biting my table. Um, see if you can catch it before it moves. See if you can see that movement that it's coming in. Those are all great things because it's hard a lot of times to see where that ball is coming off in the hand because it is coming off so quickly. That's almost easier sometimes to see the movement after it's coming in. Now, okay. if you stand in the back of the box, this is another thing that kind of depends on if you have a really good rise ball pitcher per se. If you're a really good rise ball pitcher and you're standing in the back of the box, ideally, they should be able to throw that ball like looking like it's coming in right at your waist and then it's going to drop or it's going to dive up. So by the time you make the decision to hit it, it's already going. Yeah. You're completely going to miss it. Same thing with the drop ball. You know, it's going to look like it's coming in like a strike and then it's going to die. So by the time you make the decision to hit that ball, it's already gone. So, so that's is, is there a risk if there, is there a risk if um, like if you've got a girl that has a really good rise ball, that if you stand in the front of the, in the zone, uh, in front of the batter's box, you can catch it before it's going to move. Is there also a danger from a pitching perspective that if she moves to the back, that the ball is going to rise up out of the strike zone and it's going to yep. be fair? Okay. Absolutely. Okay. So it's also learning when you, when you're learning where, how to throw a rise ball, you know, unfortunately a lot of times you're still learning the spin. So it's going to start high and go higher. It takes a lot of time to perfect that rise ball and specialize that spin. Um, so it's just knowing where you're at. Okay. Okay. Um, well, based on some of the size comments that I've had with, with our girls is, you know, that if we have anybody that's really vertically challenged, um, they get eaten up on the outside of the plate because they're, they're strikes. I mean, they're right on the edge of the plate. They're good pitches and they're right on the edge of the plate. But from her perspective, it's like, well, that's too far, or I really even can't reach it. I mean, that's how far away it is. So we've sort of leaned towards, you know, if you are a little bit shorter, you're going to have to scoot up to the plate so that you can get the outside pitches comfortably, but you're going to have to learn how to be really comfortable on an inside pitch. Because I'm assuming that if you step up on the mound and you see a girl crowd in the plate, like you said, you're going to jam her. So yep. as a hitter, if you're short and you're going to scoot up, get those outside pitches, you better be good and, and well-practiced on hitting inside pitches. So when she does jam you, you know, you can rip it up the third base line and, and, and get a, a double or a single out of that. You're, and you're working on just keeping your hands inside the ball at that point mm -hmm. and not casting. Yeah. And that's something that, 
you know, at 12, it's, it's hard to teach. A lot of girls want to cast out. A lot of them don't understand, you mm-hmm. know, at 12, you, I see a lot of girls that have a hard time hitting the outside corner because they don't want to crowd the plate because they think they're going to get hit. Yeah. But when you get up to 14, you 16, you know, that's a little bit different. Girls get a lot braver. Girls' hands get quicker. So you're also still working on in the 10 U, 12 U level, girls' hands getting quicker. Well, that's changing as you get up to 14, 16, 18. Yeah. So you've got to look at quick hands and you're looking at casting. You're looking at can they keep their hands inside the ball? That's all stuff. You know, you can obviously pick up when they're, when they're on the on deck circle. But sometimes you just have to, for the most part, when I'm calling a first pitch on a batter that I've never seen before, I'm going to see where they're standing in the box. And then the, I'm just going to throw them. So if they're crowding the plate, they're likely going to get something inside. Then if they swing at it, I can say, okay, well, they're casting the crap out of their hands. We're going to stay inside. Or, okay, they got their hands inside the ball. Let's go outside. Or let's see, let's throw some movement. Let's see if we can throw them off with a changeup. Just some different things like that. So it's really just about, I would say, kind of my, my key rules there. It's the very first pitch, never seen it before. Look at where they're standing on, in the box. Then get an idea of, are they casting? Are they keeping their hands inside the ball? Are they staying balanced or are they out in front of, are they already out in front of the ball? Say you have a slow pitcher and they're already on their front leg trying to get that ball, throw them a change up all day long because they're already off balance and they're going to be more off balance. Yeah. So looking at their weight transfer, are they keeping their weight back or are they already way out in front of the ball? Those are just some simple things you can just pick up on just by throwing them a couple pitches in the count and seeing what happens. Okay. Um, are there – are there any pitches that you do or don't like to throw in sequence? Like, are there any pitches that are back to back that you really don't, that you really won't, um, that you don't like to call or that you do like to call either, either way. Like um, you, mentioned, you mentioned inside and outside, you know, that we faced a, a batter about a, uh, uh, or a pitcher about a year ago. And within the first two batters, you could read her like clockwork, you know, it was inside, uh, she threw you two inside, then one outside. It was inside, then outside. And that's, and that's literally all she did the entire day. Um, so once you pick up on it, that's a, it's a good thing. But um, so, I, you know, I, I understand that philosophy. Um, is, there, is there anything that you don't like to do more than one time? Or well, you, know? you can't, unfortunately, be predictable in that situation. So as somebody who's calling their pitches, they have to learn that. So, like, you can't okay. say, okay, I'm going to throw two inside pitches, and then I'm going to throw an outside for – a strike three call because then again like you said it gets predictable you have to mix it up so knowing okay I'm going to come inside all right now I'm going to jam her inside high for a strike three so if I would say something that I don't like to call back to back obviously the key one there I wouldn't throw a change up back to back some people do I don't like to um that's just a personal preference sure. I've done it before it's just a lot of times you know, they may be way out in front of it and then you can get away with it, but that doesn't happen very often. Yeah, fooling somebody twice back to back is not easy. So change ups, I wouldn't go back to back. Um fastballs you can throw back to back pretty easily as long as you can hit your corner. I wouldn't come in and go like a rise ball and then a fastball high. I wouldn't come high back to back. Because okay. you want them to look at their you want them to see where the ball's coming in. Because if you throw a ball low and you throw low and you throw low and say they fouled one of those off and then you come high, you're changing where they're seeing the ball. And then that throws them off. Got it. So that would be my recommendation. And I know people do things differently. But that's kind of where I've seen success in the past. Or if you're coming in or even if you start high, say you come in with a high fastball right underneath the armpit. Okay, great. Now you have them looking up there. You think they think you're going to come in high. Well, then you come out with something at the knees. So I think it's changing where they're seeing the ball too, because you, if <clears> you're predictable, <throat> then you're you're screwed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how about um, pitch count? How much does pitch count influence? Um, you know, f- as f- for hitting, um, you know, I, I know that we spend you know having a hitting plan. I know pitchers have a plan. Um, cause 
that's one of the topics that we talk about with hitters is look, pitchers have a plan. You know, they're just not hoping to hit the strike zone. They're doing something very systematic, like a game of chess. You have to counter that and have your own uh, plan. And one of the uh, major topping uh, topics is uh, pitch count. Um, so, you know, what, as a hitter, what do you expect to see as a first pitch? And then if she's up on you, you know, and she's 0-2, what do you think is coming? Or, um, you know, if you're up 3-0, what do you think is coming? Or what is she going to throw on a full count? And I know it's going to change depending on what kind of hitter that you have, mm -hmm. everything that we've talked about, but it, and it'll also depend on what kind of pitcher you have and what kind of pitches that she has. So I'm speaking more um, generically. Like if you've got a girl that's hitting her spots, she's got a good variety of pitches, um, and you've got a good hitter who's smart, um, what are the pitch counts where you, you like to do things um, that warrant something different? So if you're ahead 0-2 on a girl, I'll just start with that one. If you're ahead 0-2, don't expect to see anything pretty. Nothing pretty. Um, expect to see movement, whether it's whether you're a right-handed batter and they're throwing a curveball out way outside and it's going way, way, way outside, or whether it's a changeup doing the same thing, um, or whether it's a drop ball coming in, you know, don't expect to see anything pretty. You're not going to get a pretty pitch, but I can damn sure promise you that if they're throwing it, they're throwing it for either a strikeout or they're throwing it to get you to swing. Because they so, go ahead. They can afford it. I mean, if it's yeah. if it's way way outside and you don't bite and it's a ball, you're still down. I mean, they're still down. So. And what they may do, so say say they your pitcher's a good curveball pitcher. Say all right, they threw that curveball so it hits the green of the plate and goes out more. All right. You didn't bite that one, but you kind of looked like you wanted to. They may come in and throw it so it hits maybe the edge of that yellow and comes back in. Good pitchers and smart pitchers can do that because they trust their spin. It just it comes down to what you can do. And you can do that with the fastball as well. It's just adjusting where you step. So you may throw a fastball, you know, two balls off the plate. Okay, you know, she looked like she kind of wanted that one. All right, let's come back in and do one ball off the plate, see if we can get her to bite because it's a little bit closer because they have pitches to give. Yeah. Okay. What about so, pitch? When you're, go ahead. No, go ahead. You go ahead. Um, when you have a pitcher that's behind in the count, so you're 2-0 or 3-0, this is when you have to know your pitchers. You should be able to go around to all your pitchers and be able to say, all right, I know when so-and-so is behind the count, she's confident that she can hit this pitch every time. And that's what you go to. Um, I have two girls that throw – that inside fastball is their pitch. They can hit it every time. We do it every time, and I know they can do it. They get behind the count. I call it. They come back. Very rarely does it not happen. So that's something that you have to communicate for. And that may change. It yeah. may change game by game. Yeah. You know, you may warm up and, all right, last game my go-to pitch was screwball. That was yesterday. I'm warming up for the game on Sunday. Hey, my screwball looks like crap. But my curveball looks awesome. I hit every single pitch. I was able to move it. So that's my go-to pitch today. So have that conversation with your pitchers before each game. Have that conversation before each starting pitcher jumps out on the mound. Say, hey, what are you confident in? What are you confident in that if you get behind the count, you can hit that pitch? Okay. Okay. Uh, what about full count? Full count. I hate that one. Um. You know, the, that one's the batters do too. Yes. Um, well, it's a common thing. We all hate it. You know, there's a part of me that likes to be, that likes to stick with what the pitcher's confident in. If they're confident in that inside fastball, I might just stay there. But there's also part of me where it's like, all right, we're three, two, say she's fouled off five or six different pitches. I'm going to call a changeup. You know, I may get a walk out of it, but there's also a chance that she's really wanting to hit that ball, that no matter where that changeup goes, she's going to swing at it. Yeah. Because that happens more times than not, too, especially if you have a good changeup. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't throw a drop ball, probably wouldn't throw a rise ball. I wouldn't throw anything really high that could look like it could be a ball. 
So I would stick really with my fastballs on the corners, my changeups on the corners. If you have somebody that's confident in their movement pitches, you can, you can get away with a curve or a screw. Okay. So if that's their go-to pitch on a, um, on an O2. Yeah. You know, that would be similar to a three, two pitch. Yeah, I think so. I think you're seeing the same pitch. Is something in that range. Yeah. And then I think you would also have to expect, you know, if you're two things you can expect, if you're to three, two count and she's throwing at you and throwing at you and you're fouling off and you're fouling off and you're fouling off, say she's throwing at you inside the whole time. Two things you can expect. You can probably expect a change up coming inside or you can expect them to completely come outside on you because you're not expecting it. I've gotten a ton of strikeouts with that where I've just stuck inside, stuck inside, stuck inside, and they're waiting on that inside pitch and I go outside, they're not ready for it. Okay. So you have to really be ready for anything. So as a, as a hitter, knowing, all right, I fouled off four or five pitches, I could be seeing an off speed, I could be seeing something completely different. Yeah. And that's where it becomes a pitcher's game, unfortunately. Sure. Well, not unfortunately for me, but fortunately for the hitter. Because there yeah. are – pitchers have a lot of different options on what they can do. Yeah. Okay. Um, that covered a lot of my questions. Um, Do you have anything else that you want to talk about? Um, I, I can't think of anything that's not more so of a mental toughness part of it. Okay. Let's cover that. Um, you know, something you need to work on with your pitchers and something that you can't get upset about. And I know it's hard to do is if they give up a home run. Oh. Because when people throw those throw those pitches where they're moving, they're going, they're going up and down like your rise in your drop. You there, Dan? I can still hear you, yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, you know, you have those girls that are throwing those rise and those drops and they do hang. It happens. They're not all gonna be perfect every time. So if you do, and this probably is more so for your catcher than anything is making sure that they're coming out and they're talking to him and that you brush it off and you come back and you throw a strike the next pitch or the next batter. Now, as a coach, you have to recognize, hey, all right, they, she just got a home run hit off of her and she's thrown three balls in a row. Probably call a timeout. Go talk to her. Go see where her head's at. Um, I do a lot of talking to my girls about, hey, it's going to happen. You have to be able to bounce back. And I actually do it in a way where it's kind of like, okay, you just got a home run hit off of you. If you throw a ball this next pitch, you got a 30-second wall sit. You know, it's just – it's something to kind of train their brain, essentially. Yeah. And that's probably more of a mental perspective part of it. No, it's great. I mean, we have we have the same conversations when it comes to hitting, you know, that if you take a strikeout looking, um, you know, when they come in, you know, after they put their bat away to say, well, what did you see? You know, what was it? What did you see? What happened? Um, and let them kind of reflect on it. Like, you know, that was a crappy strike. It was way too far outside. It was like, okay, was it a third strike outside? You know, cause that's different than yeah. the first strike outside and, and kind of give them time to reflect um, a little bit on it. Same thing within the field, you know, if it's a, a flubbed up play, you know, in the field, you know, after the fact, ask them, but, you know, playing each play, for the play and not worry about the play the next you know the two plays in front of you or two plays behind you you can't worry about that you have to worry about the play that's in front of you that's the only one that you can control so but that's tough I mean anybody that's played a sport knows that you know letting go of either an error or you know uh, giving up a home run or letting in a goal or you know whatever the sport is that that is not easy that's not easy well, I just actually, I, I was going through your outline and I saw one other question that I thought probably pertained to your tournament last weekend. What happens if they seem to be hitting everything? Seriously, how do you pitch a team or player who can hit what seems to be anything? Yeah. And after talking and, and, to a couple of your pitchers, I, I kind of gathered that was probably derived from tournament last weekend. <laughs> yeah, a couple of weeks. Yeah, I mean, they, you know, the, the, they came out – we got out of one inning and, and came out and our, our catcher looked at us and she goes, I don't know what to call. They're hitting everything. 
I mean, if, if I call outside, they hit it. If I call a drop, they hit it. Um, it, it was, it was a, it was a legit question from the catcher and it was, uh, very well founded because I, I was watching it the whole time thinking, man, these girls are beasts. They're hitting everything, um, everything that's thrown at them. So I, I don't know if the question has an answer other than, you know, you really just have to talk. I can give you advice. All right. Um, cause there's not a really good answer for it, but from a pitching perspective, if they're hitting literally everything, I would actually probably stay away from your rise and your drop. Stay away from any pitches that can be hung. Okay. So, um, because if you do unfortunately hang a pitch, you're going to pay for it. Yep. And did that happen? I'm assuming maybe. Yep. 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 Yeah. They so, fell out to the grass. Yeah. So stay away from any balls that you can hang, even just a slight chance of hanging. And really my best advice would be to keep that ball low. I wouldn't give them anything above the knees because then what you're doing is you're giving your defense a fighting chance to get a ball on the ground. Yeah. To get a play. Yep. Um, again, it comes back to just being able to throw that ball low. So you're, so from a practicing perspective, go in and say, all right, your high zone's not working. They're hitting it. Your rise and drop are out. They're hitting it. So what do you work with? You work with your screw and curve. If you have it, you work with spotting your fastball low, you work on your changeup. I mean, that's, and that's where it comes into hitting spots is so important mm -hmm. because that one little mistake, a team like that is going to make you pay for it. Yeah. So practice, practice pitching low, give yourself a fighting chance to have your defense help you. That's where your defense shines because it's not just a pitcher catcher game. Right. So right. if you're, if your pitchers keeping it low, they're putting the ball on the ground and they are playable balls. That's all you can really do. Yeah. Okay. That's kind of be my best advice there. All right. What about the last question I had on there? Do you have any thoughts on that one? Top five things a hitter does that drives a pitcher crazy. Yeah. This is Shooting this all is the, way to the front of the box. Do what? Shooting all the way to the front of the box. Okay. Drives me nuts. Okay. It drives anybody who can throw any sort of movement nuts okay because then it's taking away effectively a couple of your pitches if you can't throw them very well okay so that's probably number one number two would be purposely like almost leaning into a pitch or just really crowding the plate because they really want that outside pitch and then leaning into it because I'm not I mean I'm that person that I'm gonna hit you before I give you what you want why am I not surprised? That does not shock me at all. Well, it's I'm funny gonna... because I I somehow live with a batter who uh, does not mind it. Like, she crowds the plate and gets hit. She kind of giggles on her way to first base. Like, yeah. oh, that was a free base, but not a, that doesn't surprise me. Yeah, I'm not going to give you what you want. I'll, I'll hit you. But it drives me nuts when people ling into a pitch. Gotcha, yeah. Um, what are some other things that drive me crazy? Hmm. Oh, when batters take their practice swings and then get in the box and then hold their hand up for like 16 years, it feels like, because you're messing up my rhythm. Yeah. If you can mess a pitcher's rhythm up, you might have a fighting chance. Well, what's funny is I've given some advice to some of our pitchers that was the reverse. And um, I've made the comment that, you know, if, if a girl gets up and, and has this real crouched uh, stance and she gets in the stance before you step on the mound, man, I'd take my sweet time. Yeah, absolutely. And make her hold that position. You mentioned a wall sit. Man, it's going to feel like a wall sit. And by the time you go through with your pitch, she's all cramped up, you know, because you've been holding that position. And it uh, does. It, when you throw somebody off their rhythm, it sucks. Yeah. The, on the flip side, I've commented to the pitchers that if you get somebody who is taking their time to get ready, the, the second she's ready, be in your motion. Yeah. Like, 
like jam it down her throat, just cram her as, as quick as you can. But I've given that same advice to batters, uh, to hitters, which you hate, which is mess with her rhythm. Yeah. You know, to just change the rhythm because if, if you have the same routine when you're in the box and she pitches, if you have the same routine to the next pitch and it's, it's systematic, it's just, you know, it's 11 seconds, 11 seconds, 11 seconds, the same routine, man. And she's hitting her and she's hitting it. You're helping her. So, yeah. you know, tie your shoe, take a timeout, do, just do something to mess up her timing. So I like that one. That's a good yeah. one. Rhythm. Rhythm is a big thing okay. because I talk about it a lot about letting pitchers get into a rhythm and letting them do that. So if you can mess that up. Huge. You're right. Yeah. You're right. Um, I can't really think of anything else at the moment. So those are probably my top three. I think they're pretty big ones. I squeezed five out of you. You got front of the box, leaning into the pitch, crowding the plate, and then hands up or uh, um, putting your hand up and messing up yeah. with the rhythm. So I can squeeze five out of that. Okay. Perfect. All right. Anything else? Not that I can think of. I mean, I think – that once we go live, you know, if anybody wants to ask additional questions, then they absolutely can. But I mean, what did you, did you feel like it's kind of things you've heard before nope. reassurance of things you've heard? Yes. So, uh, okay. some, there was a, a group of things that you said that I didn't know. There was a group of things that I've been preaching uh, to our team that I was glad to hear you say, because it's, it's exactly what I've been saying. Um, but a lot with the pitch calling, you know, because, um, I don't, for just personally, I don't do the pitch calling on our team. I'm mm -hmm. more leaning towards hitters. So I like being able to understand your philosophy when it comes to pitch calling. Um, that helps me help the hitters adjust to, the, uh, to what pitch calling is happening. Um, but my hope is, is that all the coaching staff will watch us and get an insight to how to better be better pitch callers starting from practice to pre-warm up, you know, to, to actual calling the pitches in the game and that anybody that's involved with hitting can help out the hitting uh, uh, part of the game as well by watching this. So um, I'm curious, what are some things that I said that you didn't know? Um, I, and, and maybe I didn't think about it, but having that go-to pitch. Oh, yeah. Um, I was thinking of tin cup where he breaks all of his clubs, but he, he plays like a whole round with his seven iron because it's his favorite club. And he can literally hit anything with that club. When you said it, I was like, well, that makes perfect sense that you have that go-to pitch that, you know, it's like, well, I can hit that any day of the week. And pulling that pitch out at the appropriate time, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and even if that's your go-to pitch that you're like, okay, I'm going to throw that every time to get ahead in the count. Yeah, you may become predictable, but a lot of times, like, a lot of girls don't like hitting the ball on the first pitch. That's a, that's a big weakness that hitters have, is sometimes that first pitch is your best pitch that you're gonna see. Because as a, as a pitching coach and calling that, all right, I say, okay, my girl's best pitch is her inside fastball. I know that nine times out of 10, that batter's not gonna swing at that first pitch. It can be called a strike all day long. They're still not going to swing at it. Yeah. It's a huge weakness that batters have. So then you're already down one. Then I can start throwing junk at you. I've got junk that you don't want to hit. Yeah, I've got some batters that that will will never swing at a, at first pitch. They just don't. Um, I've got some that always swing at a first pitch, and then I've got one that used to never swing at the first pitches. And her comment was. She likes to see the delivery and the spin and the speed live in the box before she reacts to it. I'm like, okay, that's, that it's a thing. Um, but that same kid has now adjusted to where she more times than not will swing at the first pitch because it usually is a good pitch. We played in a tournament where she got three at bats. She only saw three pitches. She literally hit the first pitch yeah. um, all three times. Cause, and, and it was funny because I asked her after the game, and she goes, the first two pitches, um, they were outside fastballs. And she goes, I was for sure 
that my third at bat, she would not throw me another uh, outside fastball, and she did. Um, so she's like, well, that was her fault for throwing me the same pitch over and over. So, and as a pitching coach, you have to recognize those things. Yeah. So if you do have girls that are coming up that are swinging at that first pitch, then you have to mix it up. Yeah. So and go to their second best pitch. You know, if you, if you are throwing an inside fastball and that's their go-to pitch, you go to it. You may, you may luck out on seven of the nine batters, but those two that are swinging on that first pitch, you mix it up. Go to your curveball or go to your screwball. Throw them some movement. Make them see something different. Yeah. You can always come back to that inside fastball, but if they're prepared for that ball to come inside every time, well, if I'm a hitter, I'm walking up there and I'm going to take a couple steps off the plate. And yeah. I'm going to jam it down. I'm going to jam it into the third base shortstop hole. Yeah. Yeah. So that it's, it's the knowledge of – not being predictable, which I know we talked about. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I mean, that definitely plays into the rhythm of it. Absolutely. All right. Well, that's all I got. That's all I got too. All right. We'll wrap it up and uh, we'll put it up on YouTube and hopefully the rebels and everybody else can um, get a whole lot out of this. I hope so too. All right. Did you Thanks get a lot out of it? Huh? Did you get a lot out of it? Was yep. that helpful to you? Okay. Yeah. Uh, as soon as I'm done, I'm, um, yeah, I'm sending the link out to our team and making them watch it before this weekend's tournament. So. Okay. I got, I got that much out of it for sure. All right. Awesome. Well, right. if anyone Thanks. has any additional questions, let me know. Okay. So, alrighty. All right.